I'd like to introduce you to Professor Marvin Stone, who has attended both sessions of the High Speed 2 uh, Roadshow, morning and afternoon. So that's four times. Mm. Well, thank you, Don. It gives me a chance to add a little point or two to the debate on this issue. Where are we now? Uh, what will HS2 turn out to be? Well, it'll be rails, the rails from India, the rolling stock from China, the workforce, Eastern Europe, or even Ireland now. All good items for feeding the deficit, not curing it, not relieving it, not removing it. And what about future generations, our children and grandchildren? What do we have in the kitty for them? And should we spend it on bloated schemes for an uncertain future? This booklet that was distributed at the Roadshow has benefit-cost ratios calculated up to 2086. By then, there will undoubtedly be profound changes in the distribution and demography of the population of Britain, even in the physical character of the country. Railway lines washed out by torrential floods. Well, let's not go into that. Forecasting was always a fool's game, and now even more. But there are always economists, either foolish enough or financially rewarded enough, to make an economic case for their political masters. Aided by civil servants, who always have to go for the most expensive advice, because if they go for the cheapest or the cheaper, and the failure comes almost inevitably, they will be blamed for not taking the best advice. This booklet by a civit from a Civitas charitable think tank has the hard evidence that in-house or contracted economists, in-house Department of Transport for Transport, that they can make an economic case for almost any seriously defective scheme. Now, what's the alternative to HS2's madcap scheme? It is simply to upgrade the existing rail network. Now, a worthy firm of engineers, W.S. Atkins, has looked at alternatives. It has devised an economic case against that option of upgrading. By manufacturing a benefit-cost ratio of 1.4 against HS2, 2.6. It did this does this by lengthening a lot of platforms to take longer trains and widening some stretches of line, four tracks instead of two. With getting, with that, getting down to 1.4 is child's play. Well, as long as you keep your head in the sand. But think a few years down the line, the, the, the technical innovation line that is, as Brunel might have done, and the switch to train-based wireless control of 100% automated, safer, faster and closer running trains on the existing network, with no crowding and with mobile office spaces for those pampered businessmen. And at the same time, simply increase the allowance for optimism in the 2.6. Because who knows what the allowance should really have been. And reduce the implicit pessimism in the Atkins engineers 1.4. A 
and the tables might be turned. Well, that's my case, the points I can make, which I think are very relevant to the amount of reality that there is in this proposal. But just a note on two individuals. Philip Hammond is Secretary of State for Transport. On the radio the other day, he came out with the word NIMBYs. NIMBYs are what he has shamefully called the good people crowding round the maps in the HS2 roadshows. Are these roadshows perhaps then part of some trap for unwitting NIMBYs? A malicious thought perhaps, but may have some truth in it. Another, our second voice is from Ray Puddyfoot, the leader of Hillingdon Council. He has said that HS2's case is the worst case he has come across. Now I can't say that, but only because there are two unassailably monstrous examples in this booklet. But if you exclude those, which concern the distribution of funds to primary care trusts and to local authorities, if you're interested, but exclude those and HS2 would probably be in the running for number three worst. <laughs>